I'm really pleased today that we had both Martin Bailey and Martin Feldstein to come and share with you their insights from their, you know, both academic experiences, but also their experiences in, in, in the policymaking regime. They both are, have, will have very keen insights for us, and I really, really appreciate their willingness to come and educate all of us. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to, to, uh, uh, to Chris Denning, who will uh, keep us all online. Thank you. Well, uh, first, thank you, Professor Hansen, for that int introduction. And uh, let me thank Kayla, or let me uh, join Kayla briefly in thanking you for your help with organizing this event and everything else you do for undergraduates in this department. We really can't say enough about that contribution. Uh, as he said, my name is Chris Denning, and I'm going to be uh, moderating today's discussion. Before I introduce our panelists, I also need to thank a few of the people who helped make this event possible and also helped prepare me through their own hard work. Those people include Nancy Stokey, Grace Sang, Victor Lima, Kataro Yoshida and various volunteers from Chicago Society who helped with research. I also owe a great deal of thanks to Grace Hammond and Amy Boonstra for helping organize this event. Martin Feldstein is the George F. Baker Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He earned his PhD from Oxford in 1967, and he has served as President and CEO of the National Bureau of Economic Research. From 1982 to 1984, he served as Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Reagan, and we're very happy to have him with us today. Martin Bailey is the Bernard L. Schwartz Chair in Economic Policy Development and Senior Fellow and, and Director of the Business and Public Policy Initiative at the Brookings Institution. He earned his PhD from MIT in 1972, and he has previously taught at MIT and Yale. He served as Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from, 1990, from 1999 to 2001. We're delighted to welcome both of you, and thank you both for joining us. It was agreed that we're going to have some opening statements from each of you to start out the discussion, and I'd like to give each of you a chance to respond to each other's remarks. I'm, as I've said many times, I hope that this is a discussion between the two of you and not a Q&A with me. So uh, I think you both just conspired to have Professor Feldstein speak first, so I'd like to turn it over to him. Good. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for inviting me <clears throat> uh, to participate in this Becker-Friedman event. Uh, Becker and Friedman were not only are not only giants in the economics profession, but I think of them as people who were my friends over many, many, many years. Uh, Chicago has uh, good reason to be proud of their affiliation with this university, but when I ran the National Bureau of Economic Research, I also uh, looked to the names Becker and Friedman as uh, heroes of the NBER, since uh, Gary's book on human capital was an NBER study, and the uh, Friedman and Schwartz work on monetary history was an NBER project. <clears throat> so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you asked me, <clears throat> excuse me, in inviting me, you asked me to talk about some of the problems of the US economy, particularly fiscal and macroeconomic problems. So let me turn to that. There certainly are many economic problems facing the US, but I'll focus on two that I think I know how we could solve. First of those is the low rate of growth, the subprime sub rate of growth of income and employment. And the second is the long-term exploding fiscal deficit. And I think they have to be, and can be, uh, resolved together. Uh, let me say something about the facts first. Um, GDP growth since 2010 has been essentially less than 2%. It picked up a bit in the third quarter of last year, and then it slowed down again in the fourth quarter. And the forecasts for the beginning of 2014 are that it will be less than 2%. I think we could see stronger growth in 2014, but even so, we're looking at a subpar uh, increase in GDP ever since the recovery began five years ago. So as a result, we have excess capacity in the economy, and we've had a slow increase in unemployment a decrease in unemployment. The unemployment rate has come down primarily because of decreases in the labor force participation rate, fewer people looking for work. So we need faster growth for its own sake to raise incomes, and we also need it to help increase employment. The long-term fiscal problem 
is one which worries me a lot and has worried me for a long time. The debt to GDP ratio is now some 75%. Before the recession began in 2007, the debt to GDP ratio was about half that. So it's doubled in just a half dozen years. And the Congressional Budget Office forecasts that it will vary just around that 75% level for the next several years. But at the end of their 10-year forecast period, it will be some 79%. And if nothing is done to change it, at the end of their 25-year forecast period, we're looking at a debt-to-GDP ratio, debt to GDP ratio of about 100%. And that kind of debt creates very serious problems for the American economy. If you have a high ratio of debt to GDP, you're going to have to have higher taxes to finance the interest on that debt. If you have a high ratio of debt to GDP, it's going to crowd out investment in plant and equipment that increases productivity and growth. About half of our debt is now held abroad by governments and private individuals in the rest of the world. And that ratio is likely to increase if the debt ratio itself rises. Well, to finance though the transfers to the foreign holders of U.S. debt requires a weaker dollar to increase our exports and to reduce our imports. And so that weaker dollar means uh, a decrease in our, ter in our terms of trade. It means a decrease in the real incomes of Americans. So that for any given level of GDP, real incomes will be lower. So there's a lot to worry about in terms of that. So what to do about both of these problems? Let me start with the long-term deficit issue. The good news that I want to emphasize is that relatively small changes in the size of the annual deficits imply substantial long-term changes in the debt to GDP ratio. If we have a 3% of GDP deficit, that will cause the debt to GDP ratio to stay at about 75%. If we allow that deficit to rise to 4%, which is what the CBO forecasts for the end of its 10-year period and rising after that, if it goes to 4%, then we're on a path leading to a debt to GDP ratio of 100%. If we can bring it down just to 2%, then the debt to GDP ratio will fall back to 50%. So a change of just two or three percentage points in the deficit, two or three percent of GDP in the deficit can represent the kind of thing that we need to bring back and stabilize the debt ratio. So how to do it? Well, you can only do it by reducing government outlays and increasing revenue. So how do you reduce government outlays? Well, there are only three basic parts to the uh, government budget, there's the defense part, there's the non-defense discretionary part, the part that's annually appropriated by Congress, and there's the so-called mandatory part. Mandatory is a terrible word. Mandatory in, in what sense? Well, it, what it really means is automatic. It means that if Congress doesn't change the rules of our entitlement programs of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, those programs continue spending in the way that the law uh, is currently set. But they are, of course, possible sources of change. In fact, I think there really isn't any substantial room for reducing either the non-defense discretionary share of GDP or the defense share of GDP beyond those that are already built into law and expectations. Of course, there are programs that should be eliminated there's waste in the defense budget, but they're small relative to the magnitudes. The non-defense discretionary program is now 3.5% of GDP. It's heading over the next decade to 2.5% of GDP. That's the CBO's estimate. That's lower than any number we've had in the last 40 years. And the defense budget similarly is going from 3.8% of GDP to 2.7% of GDP, again, lower than any GDP share that defense has had in the last 40 years. 
So I think reducing outlays of the government requires reducing these automatic or mandatory programs. But how to do it? Social Security is the easier of the uh, programs, easier than health, because it's just about money. It's not about changing delivery systems and the like. The reason that the Social Security program is becoming more expensive over time is the good news that people are living longer. And as a result, the Social Security program, which now costs 4.9% of GDP, will rise over the next 25 years to 6.2%, a 25% increase in uh, Social Security spending as a share of GDP. Fortunately, of course, incomes are rising over this whole period, and so slowing the growth of Social Security benefits doesn't mean cutting benefits, doesn't mean cutting real benefits, it just means slowing the growth of those benefits. Well, how to do it? Well, there are many options, and I'm be interested to hear, Martin is an, uh, has written about this subject, and I'll be interested to hear his thoughts. Mine is to increase the age at which uh, full retirement benefits are paid. When Social Security was created in the 1930s, they said age 65 will be the age at which individuals will be able to get uh, their full benefits. But as the economy and as the society progressed, the, the uh, life expectancy of people at age 65 continued to rise, and it rises at about one year per decade. So by the early 1980s, it had increased by some five years, and at that point, Social Security was in financial, financial trouble. So Congress agreed to raise the retirement age from 65 to 67. Now the members of Congress are not known for their heroism, so they delayed the uh, effective date of that increase uh, by 20 years. But it worked. When it actually, when those 20 years had passed, the retirement age started to increase just from 65 to 67. And the politically important fact is that at no time during those 20 years did any member of Congress stand up and say, whoa, why don't we stop this? Why don't we reverse it? Why don't we postpone it more? They knew it would be popular to do that, but they realized the significance of the savings that would result from that increase. And so it took effect. Now, since 1983, since that legislation was passed, life expectancy has gone up by another three years. And so life expectancy now for somebody at 67 is about 18 years. And I think what we should do is simply repeat the policy change that we made back in 1983. Increase the retirement age from 67 to 70 so that the same number of uh, expected years of retirement, expected years of benefits, about 15 years, will hold. That's a reduction of about one-sixth in the number of years on average that Social Security beneficiaries will get benefits. And since it's front-loaded, since it would start at the beginning of their retirement, the present value is greater. So that's what I would do about Social Security. Health is a much more complicated story. Medicare is becoming more expensive because the population is aging, because health technology is providing opportunities to do good things for older people, to prolong life and to make life healthier and better. Um, but it's driving up health care costs. If you take not just Medicare, but Medicaid and the other federal spending on health, it's now 4.7% of GDP, and it's expected over the next 25 years to go to 8.1%. So that's a major, a major challenge. Let me just say a word about how I would deal with Medicare. The approach that I like is one that was first proposed by Alice Rivlin, a, a colleague of uh, Martin Bailey at Brookings, and Paul Ryan, now the Republican head of the House Budget Committee. 
And uh, uh, Alice has been uh, uh, continued uh, to favor that, but Paul Ryan has now uh, teamed up with uh, Senator Ron Wyden, a Democrat who will be the head, or who is the head now of the Senate Finance Committee. Their key idea is this, subsidize premiums for individuals that they can use to buy either Medicare insurance or other private policies. So the goal is not to limit health care, but rather to limit the federal obligation, to limit the amount that has to come from federal spending, either taxes or deficits. Now, I haven't said anything about revenue. I think there, that an increase in revenue can play a significant role in shrinking the uh, long-term fiscal deficits. And I think it can do so without increasing tax rates. The key is to reduce what are called tax expenditures, the government subsidies that are built into the tax law. Uh, in order to not spend this whole uh, uh, time talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, I'll wait until later to talk about the details of how I would deal with the tax expenditures. But basically, I would say individuals should continue to enjoy the various deductions and exclusions that they have now. But there should be a limit on the extent to which they can reduce their taxes by using those special deductions and, and uh, exclusions. And I look forward to talking about the specifics, but basically a program that phased in to do that could raise as much as 1% of GDP each year and therefore make a substantial contribution to the deficit reduction. Well, what about the short run problem of stimulating growth and employment? <clears throat> I think that the right way to do that is major infrastructure spending. Roads, bridges, airports, spending on those things financed by the federal government could substantially increase GDP. And I think that would be a much better design than the, the grab bag of things that were put into the 2009 so-called stimulus package, which did very little uh, direct spending and therefore did less to stimulate GDP. I think a serious stimulus program, spending more than a trillion dollars over five years, would make sense if, if, but only if, the long-term debt to GDP ratio is also being reduced by controls on entitlements and on tax expenditures. So I think if we could do both of those, deal with the long-term fiscal outlook and at the same time um, stimulate spending in the short term, I think we would solve these two major problems. Well, I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing, hearing uh, Martin Bailey. Thank you. Uh, it is a, a privilege to be here and thank you for inviting me. And uh, Chicago is such a distinguished uh, place, both the Booth School and the Economics Department. It's, it's, uh, uh, humbling to, to uh, be here and have a chance to talk here. So thank you for having me. Um, you know, I was, um, the, the BFI sent over a car to get me from the hotel and uh, I uh, asked the driver what she thought of uh, Ram Emanuel. Uh, one reason I asked is because Ram Emanuel uh, served in the Clinton administration, not very conspicuously, but he was an aide to President Clinton before becoming an aide to uh, President Obama and then mayor of Chicago. And I said, I because I didn't say this to her, but I remembered that r if I ended up sitting next to Ram in the in the White House morning meeting, he would bang me on the, on the arm much harder than I'm doing to you. I appreciate that. Uh, to say, uh, you economists have got to stay on message. You got to stay on message. So he's a tough cookie. Um, and I, uh, I hope he straightens out uh, uh, Chicago for a city that I'm uh, very fond of. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, one of the things that this driver also said, well, you know, you, you, he's trying to cut spending and you've got to cut spending, haven't you? And, and I didn't know what to say to that because I knew I was on my way to this fiscal uh, <laughs> um, seminar. And, and I am in, in the current economic circumstances, something of a Keynesian, and I agree with Marty that the way to try to stimulate growth 
in the next few years would be a, a, some kind of uh, infrastructure program. So I decided not to get into a debate about infrastructure <laughs> versus other kinds of uh, spending. Um, but I, 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 so I just said something uh, uh, anodyne uh, to that effect. Um, it's going to be uh, one reason I'm rambling off like this is because uh, Marty has said a lot of the things that I would say. And, and I want to point that out as a kind of irony because Marty is more conservative than I am. He was served in the Reagan administration <laughs> and I served in the Clinton administration. But I think as two economists who tend to see the economy much the same way, um, it wouldn't be that hard to work out an agreement if you were, if you sort of delegated the two of us or you delegated Marty and, and Larry Summers to uh, work out an agreement. I think it could be done. And that is ironic because the thing that's standing in the way of, of making progress on this fiscal issue is really the political divisiveness uh, that we have that is contributed to by folks on the left and folks on the on the right that's making it so difficult to resolve these problems. So um, anyway, what you won't get in, in cut and thrust debate here maybe um, hopefully will be as educational as we can. Um, <clears throat> so I agree that economic growth is being held back by the slow growth of aggregate demand and that we still have some fairly substantial gap between potential output and actual output. And as Marty pointed out, um, a lot of the closing of that gap that has occurred has occurred because uh, the Congressional Budget Office has downgraded its estimate of potential growth uh, because they've been a little more conservative, not actually that conservative about productivity growth, but substantially more conservative or a lower rate of growth of the labor force. And that's in response to what has been a, I don't know, exactly want to call it catastrophic, but a really amazing drop in the labor force uh, participation rate that's occurred and uh, has really shaken the view of how fast uh, labor force growth is likely to uh, occur. And will we go back to anything like the same rates of uh, labor force growth as, as we had? The answer is we won't. There's obviously been demographic change. The baby boomers are aging. Uh, but there are other changes that are taking place too. Young people are not participating. Older people are. I think they are nervous about living on Social Security. Um, but in general, um, the labor force participation has is, is gone down. Uh, women whose uh, participation rate had risen for many years, uh, that's flat or actually declined a little bit. So one of the open questions we have for growth going forwards and our ability to deal with this budget deficit in the long run is how much uh, how much labor force growth we're we're going to get. And I hope that turns out to be more than uh, uh, more than we fear, given what's happened in the last few years. I'm I'm hopeful if we get back to full employment, people will come back in the labor force. Um, now, before the Great Recession, I probably would have said, um, I, I, you know, fiscal policy is very much in the background when it comes to stabilizing the economy, getting back to full employment. Um, the times that it's been tried, it hasn't necessarily worked that well. Um, when uh, President Kennedy proposed a tax cut, it didn't come on until the economy was actually getting to the point of being overheated. So the timing hasn't always been uh, quite right. And as Marty says, the stimulus package that Obama had um, was uh, was not terribly effective. I think it I think it was positive overall for economic growth, uh, but it certainly didn't didn't do a whole lot. And uh, much more was promised from that. So it sort of ended up discrediting fiscal policy or discrediting fiscal stimulus away as a way of getting back to uh, full employment, which is which is too bad. One of the in the post-war period, I guess you'd say one of the more successful. Um, stimulus packages was the tax cuts that uh, Ronald Reagan instituted, and they did help the economy recover from the very deep recession in 1982, although they left us with some of a somewhat of a legacy of, of deficits uh, in, the, in the 1980s that they were uh, reversed. Some of those taxes were, were reversed. Um, now, why are we in such a mess? I mean, I, I do think there's been a failure of economic policy. I wish economists had some new ideas to, to put forward here beyond monetary and fiscal policy. There's nothing sort of obvious, I think, that we haven't thought of. Um, I do blame the Bush administration for leaving us with a legacy of deficits. 
you know, my role in Clinton economic policy was very small, but I am nevertheless, uh, I like to say, you know, in 1999 and 2000, two years when I was chairman of the council, we had budget surpluses. And those are the only two years uh, since the early 70s that we've had uh, budget surpluses. How did those happen? A lot of it happened from economic growth. Uh, some of it happened because of the Republican Congress that held down spending, and some of it happened because the tax increases that uh, that Clinton uh, passed. Uh, so I think one of the lessons of that period is if you can get economic growth going, um, it's, uh, it, it will help you deal with the deficit. But I also think that uh, the Bush administration, administration left us uh, with tax rates that really aren't providing the revenue that we need um, that, that Americans, I think, seem to want in terms of the Social Security and Medicare programs and the other spending um, that they uh, that they want. You know, you can tell people, shall we cut entitlements and they all cheer? And then you say, shall we cut Social Security? And they all say, no, 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 no. And they say, you're going to cut Medicare and they get out the pitchforks and, and come after you. So, you know, it, in, in a general term, entitlements, uh, we should cut them. It's hard to persuade the electorate on the specifics of what you actually uh, want to do. Uh, and, and so I, I think that was a problem coming into this. We would have been better prepared for the Great Recession if, uh, if we'd had more uh, in the tank, in the fiscal tank, a lower debt level and surpluses rather than deficits going into, into the recession. But uh, I also blame the Obama administration. I, I do think they uh, didn't do a great job on the stimulus package. It was sort of left to Congress, which meant you every congressional district got a little bit, and, and there was no real plan behind it. And as I said earlier, it was oversold uh, tremendously, and, and, and that, was a, that was a problem. Nevertheless, I think we should try again. I, I do think that interest rates are low. We are not in danger of going broke um, in the next few years. And so that a well-planned uh, infrastructure program that was paid for by some future tax increases, maybe a gas tax or a carbon tax that was phased in in the future, I think that would be uh, would help stimulate the economy. I'm not I'm not thinking that it's going to suddenly get roaring growth, but I think it would help, and that's what we should uh, do. So that's sort of the first big issue of fiscal policy, is how do you combine a stimulus for growth now with something to, to deal with the deficit uh, later? And that's the problem that, that Marty uh, addressed. The other one that I, that I want to talk about, that Marty also uh, talked about a bit too, is the way we allocate our spending. Um, because it's not just the total amount of spending, it's, it's how we're spending. And it's really changed dramatically uh, in the post-World War II period, whereas most of the money we spent was on government services, including defense, um, but, you know, uh, all kinds of things that, uh, the, that we looked to the government to do, um, and relatively little of it was spent on these uh, transfer programs, these uh, entitlement programs, and now that has completely switched around. And I think we're, we're sort of squeezing some of the other programs, maybe defense, but uh, just, uh, you know, support for uh, R&D, support for the national parks, whatever it is, your, your favorite. I think those things are not, we don't spend that much on those things. And I think it'd be a pity if they get squeezed out of the, of the budget. <clears throat> so let me comment on um, how to do that. And, and again, I, I am not uh, greatly divergent with, uh, with, with what, what's been just said, but, but maybe a little bit. Um, on the healthcare side, um, I've spent quite a bit of the last uh, 15, 20 years working with McKinsey and Company, which is uh, one of the large consulting firms. Maybe if you're Booth students, sure, some of you will be applying to McKinsey, I hope so. Um, but uh, there's a, a group there called the McKinsey Global Institute, which is a little think tank within McKinsey, and they've done a number of studies. We did a lot of studies of productivity in the 1990s that I think were, were quite interesting and helpful. And there have been a number of studies done of comparing different countries and how they uh, spend on health care. Um, and uh, the one that was done, at, done in the 1990s that I was probably most involved in was quite interesting. It, it showed that, that the US healthcare system is not just throwing away money by and large. It's actually fairly efficient in, in the way it delivers care. Um, but then the second study that came along really showed how divergent we are from other countries, both in the amount of use, I think there's overuse of healthcare, um, and we pay very high prices. 
uh, and adjusting that, um, you know, we spend, uh, the government spends a lot, but as a society, we spend, what, 17, 18% of GDP on healthcare, whereas other countries spend about half that, half the amount of uh, their GDP, which is usually smaller than ours. And uh, yeah, some of the, there, there are some differences, um, but in terms of um, many of the characteristics of healthcare, they seem to be doing a pretty good job relative to what we're doing. So how do they do it? Um, one way is through price controls, uh, and that's something that uh, we've resisted very much here in the, in the U.S. Um, and it, it took a fight in, in many of those countries, particularly controlling doctors' salaries, um, and I think that would be hard. I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't fancy the politics of trying to do that in the U.S. Um, they also control uh, drug prices, which um, generally are uh, substantially less. I think that that's becoming less of a problem because um, uh, we're using a lot more generic drugs than we used to. And actually, the United States pays, pays less for generic drugs than, than other countries uh, do. Um, but, but a lot of procedures, hospitals is really the big one. Hospital costs are just order of magnitude, much more expensive. Um, and I think it is, some of it is overuse. I, I don't think we can try to equalize prices, um, but I think if we could reduce demand by uh, shifting away from the fee-for-service system that we reimburse now to something that may be closer to a capitation system where you pay a fixed amount, and it, basically what, what managed care was. Now, Americans don't like it that much, and particularly affluent Americans don't like it, and my sense is that, um, you know, if, if you don't like it, if you want to stay with fee-for-service, that's fine, but you have to pay for the difference. And so I think in terms of what we offer to Medicare or what we're uh, now offering through Obamacare, it's got to be uh, managed care of some kind uh, that really takes away the incentive for uh, hospitals to run 95-year-old uh, or 90-year-old people uh, through the open heart surgery, one after the other, one after the other. And, you know, I, I know I'm, somebody's going to say death panels or something, and maybe that's, uh, that's right. But uh, I think we've taken that to abs an absurd uh, degree. A and uh, it's not necessarily uh, helping people who, who have those uh, operations. There may be better ways to treat those, uh, those problems. So I, I do think that some fairly major structural change in our, in our healthcare system. I am a little worried about the Ryan plan, and I know Alice is a little concerned about the, the Ryan version of the Rivlin plan. Um, I don't think we can say to the elderly, uh, particularly the very elderly, okay, we're gonna give you some money, now you go out and buy your healthcare policy. Um, I, I think that would be a, a difficult thing to impose on uh, the elderly. So I, I, I have a lot of sympathy with that approach, and I thought certainly think something like that uh, is what we need to do that changes, uh, moves us away from the, the fee-for-service uh, structure of the system and allows um, for, for uh, lower spending and maybe even better health. You know, one of the funny things about this uh, technology, and I'm, I'm speaking not from personal knowledge, but from the knowledge of the um, McKinsey folks that I worked with, who are some of whom are uh, doctors themselves, and that is the, this technology, the new technology, some of it, it does cure some people. So you get this wonderful new drug, and it does mean that some people who are going to die don't die. But actually what people don't tell you is the drug actually does kill some people too. And so on a net basis, a lot of these experimental technologies uh, are actually not net lifesavers. And so to do much more of a um, an evaluation, a realistic evaluation of how the technology should proceed and is there a, a cheaper technology that's just as good, uh, we should have incentives for that to be happening uh, more than it's happening now. Um, on the Social Security side, um, I, I think there is some scope for uh, raising the retirement age. And I wrote a book on looking at uh, retirement systems around the world. Um, I have to say my co-author, who's a uh, a Danish uh, fellow called Jacob Kierkegaard um, was the one who was uh, plugging very hard on raising the retirement age, and that's partly because in Europe, a lot of the retirement ages are very low. So they're talking about raising from 60 to 65 as a, as a big change. Um, I do think we can uh, gradually move the retirement age up. Uh, you know, I think folks like Marty and I, we probably <coughs> never retire. You know, we keep on uh, as a senior fellow indefinitely or as a, a professor at Harvard, 
you know, and, and they're not allowed to really fire us now, so we just keep going. Um, Charlie Schultz, who was the chairman of the council in, in the, um, the uh, Carter administration, has just given up his office, and he's 89, so he was coming in almost every, every day uh, until then. Whether we're still productive, I don't know, but uh, we don't much like to retire. But if you've been working for Federal Express and humping boxes, or you've been working on a construction site, um, retiring at uh, 70 is, is a pretty tall order. Uh, I think it can be done if there is some kind of way of, of people moving from the, the manual job to the, to the less demanding, physically demanding job, uh, to, to step down to a different kind of job. Um, that, that would help that uh, process along. Um, but I think the other thing that we could do to reduce uh, Social Security is to maybe limit the payments a little bit to the affluent recipients. Um, because uh, benefits, uh, I mean, the average benefit, I'm not sure uh, these days, Marty, is about 1500 2000 But But if you've, had a, if you've been at the top of the scale and you, you're, your spouse is also going to collect off your Social Security, you can be uh, really making substantially more than that every, every year. Um, 4000 a month or something like that. Um, and that is often going to people who have accumulated a good, a good bit of wealth. I'm aware of the fact that's dangerous too because you don't want to discourage people from saving for themselves by saying, if you save, we're going to cut back your Social Security. But still, I think you could do it uh, a little bit and save some, some money uh, that way. So that's sort of the two um, big issues um, to raise. One is uh, stimulus in the short run uh, and and uh, uh, balancing the budget in the in the longer run, uh, I think the other one that I'll, I'll touch on again, surprise surprise, is to do with uh, some kind of tax reform. Um, again, politically, that's going to be a nightmare. Um, we did do it once in in '86, and we've sort of undone a lot of those things. We got rid of a lot of the deductions that Marty doesn't like, that I don't like much. Um, I think it would be great to see. Uh, some of the uh, personal income deductions, uh, limits on, on uh, what we can deduct for state and local taxes. I think you'd have to phase it in gradually. Limits on what we can deduct from uh, mortgage payments. I think on the corporate side, the scope to do that, some of the uh, incentives that have been given to the energy industry, I'm not sure those are all necessary now. Um, I think that uh, limiting the amount of interest deductibility, if we'd had that in place, it probably would have uh, made for a somewhat milder recession since overborrowing uh, was certainly part of the cause of the great, of uh, the financial crisis and the great uh, recession. So I'd love to see an effort to reduce some of those uh, deductions. Um, uh, politically, I'm not holding my breath, but I, I, I certainly hope we get there. Um, the one thing that I think is sort of urgent to do is to do something about the overall corporate tax rate or the marginal rate of, of corporate taxation and the fact that uh, we, we tax um, uh, corporations on their global income. Uh, that makes us, that really makes us stand out from other countries. And um, we are suffering. I mean, one of the reasons for slow growth today is that investment is weak. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. If the overall economy is weak, investment's going to be weak. Um, if you can, you can get yourself riled up about Obamacare and regulation, maybe that's a reason why investment's weak. Um, but uh, one of the reasons I th think that, uh, that investment is weaker than it needs to be is because of taxation. Um, companies are sitting on huge amounts of money that they're holding outside the United States. And it, uh, it'd be nice if they brought some of that home and invested it here in the US. It'd be nice to encourage more foreign direct investment. We are already getting quite a bit of that. Um, foreigners own something like $24 trillion worth of assets. That's not all uh, foreign direct investment, but it's just a huge amount of uh, foreign capital held in the United States. Um, and uh, so it would be nice to attract that. And I think our corporate tax system is not conducive to that. Um, now, that seems like a very non-democratic uh, or very non-liberal thing to say. I, I would say that um, uh, Laura Tyson, who was also chairman of the council under Clinton, has proposed abolishing the corporate tax. 
Whether I want to go that far, I don't know. Um, we do need more revenue from one place or another. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, uh, we need to bring the corporate tax rate in alignment with other countries so that we are not disincentivizing our, our corporations from locating here. Um, and we're not uh, creating a disincentive for foreign companies to invest in, in the United States. Um, you know, uh, CEOs say they get a lot of pressure from their boards to actually relocate their headquarters overseas. And uh, I said that to somebody in the administration. They said, but companies don't do that. And I said, well, Anheuser-Busch did. And they said, well, they got taken over. Yeah, they got taken over. Why? So that they can locate overseas and not count their global income uh, against their taxes. And I know the CEO of, of Coca-Cola has gotten all kinds of pressure from his, from his board, from his shareholders to uh, make that company not an American company. I don't think that's silly that we create uh, that incentive. That doesn't, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to me. Uh, finally, where would I get uh, revenue from? I think it'd be great if we could get it from limiting deductions. Uh, I think that uh, some kind of carbon tax or gasoline tax, uh, coal tax, whatever, whatever you could get, um, I would be in favor of that. The gasoline tax has been going down and down in real terms and as a percent of a gallon of gas. And nobody likes to pay high prices for gas, but I think it's a good way of getting revenue and uh, it discourages the use of, uh, of fossil fuels. I'll stop there. All right, perfect. Like I guess I want to give each of you guys a chance to respond to each other. So Professor Feldstein, I'm going to turn it over to you next. But first, let me say, or let me focus you on a couple of things specifically. Both of you have talked about social security. And uh, Professor, you published a paper just yesterday, the Wi-Fi at the hotel must have been great for a project syndicate, <laughs> where you were saying that we should allow investment-based personal retirement accounts. And Dr. Bailey, you've also written about how people should be allowed to have individual retirement accounts, something somewhat private. Could you both talk about that a little bit in responses to each other? Well, I think the amazing thing is how little disagreement Martin and I have. <laughs> Discouraging uh, for you, perhaps, but... Uh... Um, yeah, it makes, uh, it makes for a dull hour and a quarter. We're not saying, oh, no, you got it all wrong. You just don't have the economics right. We seem to agree on the fundamentals that uh, we have to deal with the entitlements. And then now it's a question of, of exactly how. So you asked about uh, Social Security. Um, I think the idea of saying, as we did in 1983, that uh, we ought to set the age for full retirement benefits at 15 years. But if you want to retire earlier <clears throat> with an actuarial reduction, you can do so. So now it's 67, but you can retire at 62, or you can work a little longer and get more, uh, more annual uh, benefits. Uh, so I think uh, making that same adjustment now would mean going from 67 to 70. And I think you can't do it overnight. You can't spring on people who are planning to retire next year that, uh, uh, sorry, you've got to uh, work another year or three years. <clears throat> but I think doing what uh, Congress did back in 1983 and gradually <clears throat> phasing it in makes sense. There was a recent uh, National Bureau of Economic Research study by David Cutler and co-authors uh, uh, asking the following question. What do we know on the basis of the detailed health surveys that are done about <clears throat> whether the people who live longer now than they did in the past, whether these are healthy extra years or they're just years in which disability grows as they move into, and the answer seems to be there's no increase in the number of disability years. <laughs> they didn't say that about academics, but uh, <laughs> where the output is well, a, little, is a little, 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 little trickier to measure the output, but. But in terms of all of the basic measures of, of disability, and so I think that speaks to the question that you raised about whether uh, people are going to be able to work extra years if they want to. Now, the, the reality is that many people choose to retire before they get full benefits. So they're retiring at 63 and 64 instead of 65 or 67. But that's done in a way that they have the choice and that the um, 
the benefits are adjusted in such a way that the net cost to the ultimately to the taxpayer is independent of when people choose to retire, at least to a kind of first approximation. Now, uh, Martin, you raised the issue of, well, maybe we should uh, reduce the benefits a bit for higher uh, income individuals. And the good news is the Reagan administration already did that for you by taxing yeah. benefits. Yeah. So if your income is above I think something like $25,000, an unindexed amount, yeah. then your social, your income, including your social security benefits, then that's subject uh, to the personal income tax. So if you're uh, somebody with a, a high income, 40% uh, uh, marginal tax rate, then 40% of your social security benefits are clawed back by uh, the personal income tax. So it's as if there's a 40% reduction in uh, Social Security benefits for high-income people and no reduction for uh, low-income people. So I think, um, uh, I think the key is to do what we did in 83, pass it with a long delay so that nobody, nobody who was over the age of 45 uh, in uh, 1983 was going to be affected by it. I think that's a little too cowardly on the part of the Congress. <laughs> Maybe 55. But that would mean that we could get a handle on this and I would do it so that it's permanently indexed uh, so that one doesn't have a, uh, to refight this fight every couple of decades. Well, that, that was the proposal that Jacob Kierkegaard and I had in the uh, book, so I can hardly, to yeah, to yeah. index, so I can hardly uh, fight you too much. I, I will say the thing that, that worries me a little bit about it, I mean, if it's true that you can take Social Security early, but uh, according to, I think, John Chauvin's calculations, you get an 8% rate of return by postponing taking uh, Social Security. So the affluent, like me, um, uh, don't, draw Social Security until they, they, they start giving it to you at, at age 70, um, whereas someone who really doesn't, is, feels not able to, to work, uh, takes it at 62, uh, and then they don't have a whole lot to, to live on. If they die, their spouse doesn't have a whole lot. To, it's often the, the, the woman in the household. So we do have a lot of elderly, very poor widows, which is a group that I think uh, Social Security would do well to try to to help uh, since the, they are left in, in, in often in very poor circumstances. But, but let me speak to the, the specific point you raised about individual accounts. One of the other things we had in our, our book was a proposal that at, at least to start things rolling by offering um, voluntary um, individual accounts that, that people could choose to set aside an additional amount, um, just as uh, many of us have in, in our uh, retirement pension plans in our jobs, but not everyone has the opportunity to do that. Um, there would be some subsidy to that in that the administrative costs would be covered um, by the by the government, uh, although the money wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be invested by the government. You would uh, maybe try to put it out to uh, private investment plans under that that had registered um, with with the program, um, because that. You know, the, the difficulty with a lot of very small accounts, and you remember that Bush wanted to start individual for uh, small accounts, and he wanted to replace uh, Social Security with those, and, and that proposal didn't get anywhere. And one of the problems was that, um, you know, when they, when they went to some of the, you know, the fidelities and vanguards of this world, they said, you know, handling millions and millions of very small accounts is just not economic for us. Uh, you, you lose most of the return on the administrative costs of, of operating those. Um, so I think if you could uh, provide a consolidation of those funds, and they do something like this in Sweden, uh, consolidation of those funds and then have it privately in, invested so that people have the option of putting a little extra aside <coughs> who, who maybe don't at this time have it through their employers, um, I think that would be very beneficial. And then if it started to become popular, I might think about whether you wanted to make it compulsory for people who were not participating in employer plans. Um, because I think young people don't always look 40 years ahead. 
uh, who wants to think about being 70? Um, and so they don't necessarily uh, act all that rationally in quite the way that Gary Becker might have predicted um, in terms of the decisions they make uh, for 40 years ahead. So I might uh, think about making it compulsory, but I'd start by making it voluntary. Um, just a minor correction on the Bush uh, history. Uh, Bush did not want to replace uh, Social Security. What he wanted was a mixed system in which you would maintain the... Okay, okay. I, I, I agree. I okay, sorry. No problem. It, 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 Good. The sort of desire, I think, was to try to replace it. No, the desire of some of the staff was to replace it. But okay. that, I okay. spent a lot of time talking to President Bush about that subject, and there was a, a gap between the president and the people who were designing what was a well, good strange program, right. So good he was on the right side. Uh, Rahm Emanuel was an advocate uh, when he was uh, in the Congress and then when he was in the um, Obama administration of automatic enrollment IRAs. Right. And I think that's a great idea. What an automatic enrollment IRA is, it works, it works like this. You come to the company and they say to you, welcome to our company and we have a, an, an IRA uh, plan here in which we're going to automatically take 3% of your salary and contribute it to an IRA and you check a box. You want it to go to Fidelity or you want it to go to Vanguard or whatever. But if you don't want it at all, then all you have to do is file a form or check a different box and we'll give you the money back. So you're automatically enrolled unless you say you don't want to, and then you can have the money back. So it's voluntary in that sense. Well, what's been found, and David Labeson, my colleague at Harvard, has done a lot of research on this, is that when companies do that, something like 85 or 90% of people, when they're automatically enrolled, um, uh, stay in. They don't take the money out. While if you say to the same people, um, if you'd like to be involved in an IRA, we can put you in one and just fill out this form. It's more like 50%. So this uh, warms the heart of people who study behavioral economics. They say, here's an example where <coughs> there's no rational reason why where you start, where your, your initial condition should determine what you choose to do. But it does seem to be true that once people get the sense, well, everybody in this company is doing it, me too. So I think we should do that. And I don't know exactly what it is that President Obama proposed in the State of the Union, the My IRA, but I think it's a, a step in that direction, but with the funds just invested in government bonds. And that strikes me as Social Security by another name. It's, it's not a way of getting capital and the return that you get uh, from capital. Uh, so I would say that that something that uh, subsidizes <clears throat> as the um, <clears throat> excuse me as the Obama administration proposed early on in the first year subsidizes small businesses to deal with the administrative right. costs right. Uh, is a good idea and uh, would allow us to expand the number of people who have IRA accounts. Perfect. Throw us, throw us another question. All right, you want another before, question? Against All right. The audience. So, I have a few. You have a few. So there's an issue that's been playing out in the op-eds quite a bit. Professor Feldstein, you've taken part, as well as our, our own Casey Mulligan, uh, and that's Obamacare. Professor Feldstein, uh -huh. you started out as a health economist. You've been very critical of this. Tell us what's going on. Uh, I think Obamacare is on a path of self-destruction. Um, so it's not a question of whether it's good or bad, but whether it can last. And the reason for that is this. A key feature of Obamacare is that it says anybody can get insurance, can go to any insurance company and get insurance regardless of pre-existing conditions. So if I've been turned down in the past because I have diabetes or because I have cancer or because I have had cancer, that's no longer an issue. I can get insurance whenever uh, I want. Now, not literally whenever I want. There's an open enrollment period um, at the end of the year for three months. But it basically says that anybody 
can get insurance when they discover that they have a costly medical problem. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Well, what we're discovering already is that young people are not signing up because they know that the premiums are not adjusted to make it a good deal for young people. The uh, stories in the newspaper every day say young people are being recruited so that their premiums can help to offset the costs of older people, uh, middle age and older people, and particularly sick people who are, so it's gonna be very hard when you have this self-selection process at work, the healthy and the young are gonna stay out, and those who are sick or older are gonna sign up, and that's gonna drive up the premiums, and that's gonna drive more young people out. So I think it's on a path of, path of self-destruction, and as more people focus on this idea, that if I don't have insurance, pay out of, remember if you have insurance, you have to pay premiums. Uh, if I don't have insurance, well, if I get sick, or if my children get sick, and it's gonna be an expensive disease, well then I can go and get, um, um, get insurance at that time. But until then, I'll self-insure. I will remain uninsured. Now I think some clever insurance companies are gonna come along and they're gonna say, what about if you're in a car accident or a skiing accident or you have a heart attack? Well, you're not gonna be able to rush to the insurance company the next day and get yourself insured. In fact, you're not gonna be allowed to for a few months. So what are we gonna do? Well, the insurance company will offer a product which will be a very narrow product of, of emergency insurance. When you have that car accident or that heart attack, uh, it'll cover you. It'll only cover you for as many months as you need until you can sign up for Obamacare. And uh, therefore, it's gonna be a relatively inexpensive policy. And so I think that'll drag off, suck off, even more of the population who will say, why don't we get this separate insurance policy, and then if we really need uh, something, we can go and, so I think it's on a path to self-destruction. You think I'm too pessimistic? Well, I think you're a bit too pessimistic. I think you're a bit unfair to what uh, the Obamacare is trying to do. One of the things that Obamacare has taken a huge amount of heat for is that it includes a mandate that everyone is supposed to get insurance. And why did they include that mandate, which is very politically unpopular, which really riles uh, Americans up uh, some kind of compulsory thing. I mean, we have compulsory insurance now for automobiles, for example, um, but, but uh, nobody likes that kind of uh, uh, mandate. But the, the purpose of the mandate was exactly to offset the problem that you just described, that if you, if you just take away the pre-existing conditions and don't have a mandate, then people won't buy insurance. All right, so what you're saying is, um, because the penalties are not that high if right. you don't have insurance, um, you know, because they've sort of backed away a little bit from really hammering people if they don't have insurance, which politically I think they sort of had to do, um, then, then you get this loophole, which is that you, you don't buy insurance until you, you get sick. And you're right, that's a very serious issue. But I think with some, you know, I don't want to exactly defend Obamacare. I don't think they did it that well. Uh, and I'm intrigued, actually, it was just released the, um, some of the Clinton papers. And, and uh, you, you know, remember Hillary Care? That was, uh, that was a bit of a disaster. Um, and, uh, except it didn't happen. Except it didn't happen. Right. Um, so it was a disaster for her well, at the time. Well, yes. I, I, you know, I did grow up in England. We do have that. We did have the National Health Service. Most European countries have uh, comprehensive health insurance. I'm a believer that that's something that we as a country should aim towards, because what happens to people who have uh, car accidents is that they go to the hospital and they they get treated anyway, um, and uh, the rest of us have to pay the bill. So I I think that uh, you know, uh, it's it. It would be a much better system if we could get everybody into the into the fold, and I think the 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 way to go. Well, first of all, Obama decided to make insurance comprehensive before he dealt with the cost problem. So you, you know that's you know what order do you want to do these things in? Do you want to try to control healthcare costs and then expand it? 
um, or do you want to just try expanding it? And I think he felt that was his one chance to expand it. And if it if you get that established, uh, that would be there in, in indefinitely. Uh, you may be right that it's on a path to destruction. My guess is that there'll be various kinds of fixes to try to get around that, to provide subsidized premiums to low-income people, uh, to get the young people into the in, into the mix. But it's a really hard problem, and I don't think you can just say, "Well, they did this stupid thing." I think they were. I think they recognized that problem, and that was, was why they had the mandate in there. I think uh, President Obama said at some point, "America is not ready for a single uh, single payer system." Probably British right. British right. side. Probably so right. he figured out the politics. And so we have this instead, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's just not gonna work because the incentives are so strong. Uh, because as you said, there's a mandate, but the mandate is not you go to jail if, or, you know, or anything like that. It is you pay $2,000, or I forget what the percentage is of your income, but not more than so many dollars. Uh, so uh, we're seeing a lot of companies um, playing around with the number of hours that their workers work in order to get out, get around the mandate. And we're seeing lots of young people are saying, I'm not gonna sign up, so. How, how is Massachusetts working? Because that was a precursor of Obamacare. Yeah, and it, many of the people who worked on Massachusetts yeah, also and it, worked and on it, Obamacare. And it started, is that failing? No, I, it's, you know, I don't exactly understand why. Uh, but Massachusetts <laughs> started with um, a very expensive, the most expensive, I think, Medicaid system. So they had 90 plus percent of people covered when they introduced the, um, uh, the precursor of Obamacare. So there wasn't a big gap to fill and they didn't fill all of it. So it just wasn't, uh, but what has happened is that healthcare costs in Massachusetts have risen more rapidly, I understand, uh, although I'm not an expert on this, I think they have risen more rapidly than in other parts of the country uh, as a result. Well, let me follow up on this for a second because John Gruber, one of your colleagues at the NBER, has written about how Obamacare could help alleviate what's known as job lock. So yes. could either of you explain what he means by that and then whether or not you believe that argument? Well, I'll, I'll make a comment on it, I, and, and I'm not, I haven't read specifically, uh, I, I, I've seen the, a reference to that. But, uh, I mean, it is the case that a lot of people uh, work because, in a, and stay in a particular job. I think what he's referring to is that you don't, you, maybe you don't like your job anymore, or you, you don't like your boss, or you think you could get a better job, but you're afraid to leave because uh, you feel locked in by the healthcare coverage, and you don't know that if you, changed or started looking for a new job or moved to a different city, you would necessarily be able to get the health insurance. So if you could be covered under some Obamacare provision, you would, you would free people up to search the labor market more effectively. And I think all of us would feel, and economists would feel, if people search more and a more, there's a more flexible labor market would be a more efficient labor market. Now, one of the things just following on from that is that the, the CBO has reported that there might be as many as two million plus people who would quit working altogether if under Obamacare because they are working now because they, they feel they have to because they're not eligible for Medicare. And uh, so if you provide them with Obamacare, maybe they would quit working. And, and that's become a political issue. Oh, we're losing two million jobs. Well, we're not exactly losing two million jobs. We may be losing two million more participants in the, in the workforce. And uh, that, is a, that is a worrying uh, possibility uh, when we're trying to do something about the deficit and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and I think it is true in Europe that uh, one of the reasons people retire earlier and, and fewer people participate, uh, that's not true in every European country. In some European countries, more participate than in the United States. But in some of them, not so many people participate is because they can get free health care. They don't have to work to get health care. Yeah, the um, uh, John Gruber's uh, point was made in response to the Congressional Budget Office study yeah. that, uh, as Martin said, pointed to a loss of two and a half million full-time equivalent workers. And uh, to most economists, that sounds like, and, and the way the CBO uh, report on that uh, discussed it was, well, there are all these disincentive effects. There, <clears throat> there's the, um, 
higher effective tax rates and so on that will uh, encourage people to, but also uh, some people will, and this was John Gruber's point, some people will um, uh, leave jobs because they no longer need the job, they can go directly and uh, buy this insurance. So it's not just job lock, it's work lock. I mean, they are, they're, um, uh, participating in the workforce in order to get health insurance, which they won't have to under the um, Obamacare uh, arrangements. You know, Martin said rightly that we um, in the United States, our health care costs are higher than in other countries. They uh, rise faster. And, and I, it's a thing that has interested me for many years. And I think um, a key reason for it is that we have a tax system which encourages people to um, buy health insurance and to have their employers buy health insurance because employer payments for health insurance are excluded from personal income. And it is the largest of the tax expenditures. And um, the, um, the fact that the um, uh, individuals get much more comprehensive insurance. If I'm somebody whose combined marginal tax rate, federal, state, social security is 35 or 40 percent, then every dollar that my employer gives me in cash only gives me 60 cents to spend. But if he gives it to me in health insurance, well, I get the full dollar's worth of health insurance. So not surprisingly, people are getting health insurance with smaller deductibles, uh, smaller co-payments, and that's driving up the demand and encouraging the hospitals to provide more services. Uh, in some ways, that's a good thing, but obviously at the margin, uh, the value of those services is less than um, the cost of producing them, and that's a result of this indirect tax subsidy. So it's high on my list of things that I would uh, put under the, the, the limiting of the ability of individuals. So <clears throat> Martin said, you know, uh, I think your list included mortgages, uh, state taxes. I don't know if I mentioned that one, but I should have. Yeah, yes. I certainly would, yeah. So uh, I think it's very, very hard politically to take away any of those things. And to say, well, we're gonna take away the whole mortgage interest deduction, but we're going to let uh, people continue to have some other benefit, I think that's very hard to do. So what I have been pushing, talking about, writing about, running numbers for, is putting an overall cap on the extent to which um, individuals can reduce their tax liability. So the my, the, my favorite plan would say you can have all of these deductions, you can have all of these exclusions, the exclusion for um, municipal bond interest, but with a couple of exceptions which I'll come back to if you want. But when you figure out how much you're saving in taxes by doing this, if it exceeds 2% of your adjusted gross income, <clears throat> then you have to pay, you have to add that saving back into your tax bill. So um, if you did that, everybody would still say, well, I still can get a benefit from being, from having a mortgage. I can still get a benefit from uh, paying state and local taxes and so on. But I have to pay some more taxes. From an, an economic point of view, it not only produces more taxes, but it eliminates these distortions because at the margin, I no longer have the incentive for higher um, interest deductions. I no longer have the incentive for uh, my town to provide more and more local public services because I'm paying for them with tax deductible dollars. So I think you get a big improvement in incentives and a great simplification because many people would say, oh, if I can't get as much benefit from itemizing my taxes as I have in the past, I'm going to take the standard deduction. And that means I don't have to keep records and fill out complicated forms. I just get a certain amount each year as a deduction 
regardless of whether I'm a homeowner or a renter, regardless of whether I live in a town that has high taxes or low taxes. So I think um, the calculations that I did suggest that instead of something like 45 million taxpayers itemizing their deductions, if we had a 2% limit on their, as, as a share of AGI, adjusted gross income, that would drop to about 15 million. So two thirds of the people who now itemize would no longer uh, go through all of the hassle of uh, itemizing their returns. I spent uh, three years as a partner at McKinsey in the 1990s, and I, it was a nice salary you get in that organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the healthcare benefits were spectacular, I've got to <laughs> say. My, my wife uh, had all her teeth done. And uh, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you're a senior partner at McKinsey and you get tennis elbow, well, you know, you find the, the guy that helps the Davis Cup team and you go <laughs> see him and, and his bill gets paid. Cadillac plans, I agree. We need, we need not, I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just they shouldn't be tax deductible. Right. right. Tax excludable. Tax excludable. excludable. So I said, let's allow people to exclude $8,000 worth, but anything in excess of that would be put in together with the deductions with the, the state and local. The one thing that I would set aside is the charitable deduction. And the reason I would do that is when I think about the health care benefit, well, that benefits me. When I think about the, uh, the mortgage interest, well, that benefits me. When I think about the charitable deduction, well, that benefits the charity to which I'm giving the money. So uh, I would allow people to still make charitable deductions, not that anybody is giving me the power to do this, but <laughs> I would still give people the opportunity to make charitable deductions in a tax deductible way. Less amount of agreements giving a whole new meaning to the benevolent social planner, but uh, <laughs> I wanna, so we've been talking about taxes. I, I don't think so. I think you, you, we're saying don't give tax advantages to certain classes of spending. Um, I think it's that's that's different. You don't want to be trying oh. to say. I mean, you two agree on so away. much. We could make you dictators of the economy. Uh, Everything would be great. I mean, we're we're <laughs> aspiring <laughs> to that. We're, we're working on it. Yeah. We'll see what we can do. Um, so, we've been talking about taxes, we've been skirting around it this entire time. Let's make you two dictators of the U.S. economy. How would you make the tax code, regardless of political considerations? Well, I like what uh, Martin said about the corporate tax. I didn't know that was his view, but I think, um, here we go again, it's a <laughs> bipartisan agreement. So we have a 35% corporate tax rate, plus state taxes on top of that, which, while they're since they're deductible, means that the combined rate is close to 40%. The average rate in other countries, which don't have a federal uh, system, so it's just a single corporate rate, is 25% in the OECD countries and the other industrial countries. So we're at 3940 and they're at 25. And as Martin said, that just drives American businesses into using their overseas subsidiaries to expand, some of them to move overseas, American businesses being acquired by foreign companies so that the taxes will be collected there. And then the other thing is, the, as again, Martin and I seem to agree, is that the way in which we tax the profits of the foreign subsidiaries of U.S. companies is very counterproductive. If a French company has a subsidiary that uh, is in, say, Ireland, and earns some profits, and brings those profits back to France, well, it's paid its tax in Ireland, and France says, well, we will charge you 5% of those profits as an extra tax when you bring it back. But that's all. If they bring it to the United States, if it's an American company, similar situation, makes profits in Ireland, pays the tax in Ireland, and then brings those profits back to the United States, they have to pay the full 35% federal rate minus a credit for what they've paid in Ireland, which is about 12%. So, you think they bring the money back? No. They say there must be a better place in the world to shift those profits to expand our businesses. So it's really counterproductive, and I agree with Martin that we would do better to have a system, and 
And there was a while when the Obama administration was thinking about it, and then it somehow disappeared for reasons that I didn't understand. Do you understand why it went away? No, not really. <clears throat> the last conversation I had with, with someone in the administration, it was the focus was really on the... Uh, let me backtrack. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily gone away trying, trying to reform the corporate tax. Uh, I, I think when, when I last talked to Jason Furman, he felt that was very much part of their agenda for the rest of the, the Obama term. Whether it gets anywhere or not, uh, I don't know. I mean, one of the problems is that um, you know, I think, and this is, I think this is true of some of the people in the Obama administration have said to corporate groups, the business roundtable or someone like that, you go away and come back with a revenue neutral proposal for a more efficient tax system. And the trouble is they can't agree because, um, you know, if you're a company that's getting lots and lots of great deductions, you don't necessarily want to trade off giving up those deductions for a lower corporate tax rate, whereas another company might. So I think there's been, it's again, the politics of it is difficult to achieve, but, but uh, um, it, Jason was, was, was cautiously optimistic that they would I mean, make some this, progress. On this foreign tax treatment, a so-called territorial system, which is what the rest of the world does and we don't, in which you allow uh, funds to come home once they've been taxed overseas with a, only a small tax here, um, uh, for a company that has lots of overseas profits, that's an attractive proposition. And they're willing to give up other things, the research and development credit or the manufacturing credit and so on. But if you're a company that is just a U.S.-based company and doesn't do anything overseas, why do you want to give up any of the special advantages that you have now, accelerated depreciation, R&D credit, and the like, in order to benefit those guys who are doing business abroad? So that makes it very difficult. And unlike the personal income tax, where there are lots of these hidden subsidies, lots of these tax expenditures, the mortgage interest and so on, there's very little on the corporate side. There's the energy industry that gets certain things. There's the famous corporate jets, but there's just not a lot of dollars no, there. No, so you can't offset uh, any kind of major change. Um, and so, um, so that makes it so politically difficult. I, I would, um, and, and the, uh, the other thing is I do think, and, and this was something that I was a little surprised Marty agreed as much as he did with the fact that we do need some more revenue somewhere down the line. Even if we do, um, you know, as much cutting of, of uh, health care programs and as much cutting of Social Security as the American public is willing to swallow, uh, it still is going to be difficult to deal with the aging baby boomers. And, and I think and, there's a political thing in which Democrats are saying we will at least they say it sometimes, we will agree to reductions in entitlement programs if the Republicans will agree to significant revenue raising. And I, I think that if that's the political compromise that's necessary, then the question is how do you raise that revenue? And, and I think the way to raise it is not by raising tax rates with all the adverse incentive effects associated with that, but with base broadening, or another way of saying it, putting limits on these tax expenditures. How do you feel about a carbon tax? Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I would go along with a gasoline tax. Um, I think, in fact, I think I have I've written too many things, but I think I've written something <laughs> saying that I would favor a gasoline tax because, you know, there are a lot of estimates of the externalities associated with driving. So. The more uh, I drive, the more likely I am to hit some other car, the more likely I am to pollute the atmosphere, and so on. So there is a justification for a tax in terms of the externalities, but I think there's also, at least historically, has been a justification in terms of foreign policy. Exactly. And now that may, change that may change as a result of US becoming more, or North America becoming more energy independent. So. Um, I may have made a very good argument, which doesn't carry over um, uh, into the future for that. But I think there is a case, an environmental case, for doing it, and I'd rather do it by penalizing 
uh, the negative externalities of uh, carbon use than by going around giving lots of subsidies to to uh, windmills and uh, uh, solar panels and so on. So they're on my list of things that, and those are subsidies which are done through the tax code so that they never come up for uh, reauthorization. They're just there forever and ever and ever until somebody takes them back, unlike annually appropriated programs in the non-defense discretionary area. So the people who put them in were very clever. They put them in knowing that they would just stay there and keep spending money uh, indefinitely. When I say to my Republican friends, you're in favor of cutting spending, right? Yes. So isn't a subsidy for solar panels spending? Uh, isn't a, a subsidy for um, uh, fuel efficient cars a form of spending? Uh, and so on. And so I would say that the things that I'm talking about putting a cap on represent government spending. Unfortunately, it shows up on the revenue side of the government's budget rather than on the outlay side. And so it's a tough sell because the congressman who understands it says to me, Marty, I got it. I understand it. It's, it's a spending cut. But when I go home to my town meeting and I say I'm going to vote to limit this form of spending, some guy is going to say, that means my taxes are going up, and I don't want my taxes to go up. So somehow the clever people who built these things in uh, to the tax code have protected spending programs that would be much easier to, to go after, and I don't know how we deal with it. So I'm surprised. I, I just gave you two dictatorial power over the U.S. economy, <laughs> oh, and it sounds like and it sounds like you're, you're cutting around the edges. You, you just want to get rid of some subsidies. Time, never spend any time thinking about what I would do as dictator, because I I don't think anybody's going to make me dictator, and so uh, <laughs> alas, uh, so all I can do is solve the problem of slow economic growth, uh, low unemployment, uh, and excess long-term deficits. That's enough. At least enough for an afternoon. I think the, the things we described in terms of tax reform, um, I think we both of us felt that they'd be very difficult to get through politically. So dictatorial powers would be nice. So if you're handing them around, we'll do that. <laughs> but I don't think that's just around the edges. I think that would be a major difference. And we'd probably, if you gave us that power, we'd probably go even further. But remember what happened in the 1986 Tax Reform Act. That was really quite amazing. Tax rate, the maximum tax rate in 1986 was 50%, 50%, and they agreed to bring it down to 28, so that the maximum tax rate was 28%, and that was achieved in a revenue neutral, distributionally neutral way, meaning that um, by taking away some of the tax benefits, special tax loopholes, uh, accounting gimmicks, you could broaden the tax base, bring down the tax rate, and still have uh, the same amount of revenue. And the way they did it was to say, well, what can, we, what can we get rid of? If we change this tax loophole, get rid of um, uh, losses associated with uh, oil drilling for individuals, or losses associated with uh, uh, cattle raising for individuals. We get rid of all those, how much can we raise in revenue? We'll give it back in the form of lower marginal tax rates. And that allowed them to go from 50 to 28 percent. And, and of course, <clears throat> when rates came down that much, there was a big increase in taxable income. People who would have hidden their income, or that's the wrong way to put it, who had taken their income in non-taxable form and fringe benefits and so on, um, we're now prepared to take it in taxable form, and so revenue went up substantially. So um, it happened once. We got a big tax reform. Uh, I think it's going to be tougher because after rates came down, it didn't stay down, and they it crept back up. So we've gone from 28 to a little over 40 percent for high-income individuals, and it's going to be hard to persuade them that if they give up more things, 
they will be able to have some lower rates. So it has to be a combination of <coughs> some rate reduction and the pressure of the fiscal deficits and understanding that that's a serious problem. Perfect. I want to touch on one more thing, and then in about 10 minutes, I want to open it up to some audience questions. But uh, you know, income inequality has really been an issue that's become very contentious in the media. You know, we've had the Occupy movement; they even showed up here once. Uh, do you think it's economically important, and do you think the government has a position where they should try to do something about it? Gosh, that's a tough one. Yes, I do think it's um, economically important. Um, we we have seen a substantial widening of the income distribution. Um, the most uh, sharp way that it's widened is at the very top, the so-called runaway top. So the top for one, two, three percent. Um, and quite a bit of that is to do with globalization, maybe somewhat to do with uh, technology. But there's also been a widening so that um, median, um, median earnings, so median incomes, uh, have really not kept up um, with with upper incomes, and it, I think it creates a lot of bad outcomes for our society. It creates a sense of disenfranchisement. I think it contributes to the political polarization that we are uh, witnessing. I don't think it's the only reason for that, but I think it's one of the uh, reasons for that. And I, I think it's being driven by some rather fundamental forces because it, it you can see it affecting many other countries. Um, I think it's affecting Europe the same way. They have a lot more redistribution in Europe. So, uh, but even even so, they're seeing the same the same things. Um, economists are fond of calling it skill bias technical change, which is just a, a name. It's sort of like when your doctor names an illness and gives it some Latin name, which just means sore feet or something. But uh, <laughs> but it, it it I think it's a reality. Um, that uh, <clears throat> the way that uh, particularly it's not just globalization, but that's part of it, obviously, um, the, that uh, we, we almost are creating something of a, a two Americas where those with college educations or those with sufficient smarts or sufficient skills, you can do pretty well if you're a good plumber or a good auto mechanics, not all college educated stuff, but those with skills are, are able to do very well, um, but those who don't have those skills um, end up in, in low wage, low productivity jobs. And American companies are very good at being productive with um, low skill workers. You know, McDonald's has the whole system down, Walmart has the whole system down. They don't uh, require a lot of skill in the, in the workers, so you can be a relatively efficient and productive and profitable company, but um, the, the wages that come out, uh, the demand for low-skilled labor is such that there's a, a downward pressure on, on wages. So what can the government uh, do about it? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have good answers. One answer they're pursuing right now is to increase the minimum wage. Um, I'm willing to support an increase in the minimum wage. I'm not crazy about that as a solution because it's a form of price control. It probably has some negative effect on employment. Uh, maybe uh, given that the, the real minimum wage has dropped, uh, it's worth putting it up a bit, but it, it's certainly not my favorite solution, but it's, uh, it, it's probably one I'd be uh, willing to support in the, in the current uh, environment as long as it's, it's not too drastic an increase. Um, Obviously, what we'd like to do is to have a better education system and a better training system so that more people can command higher skills and higher wages, and we don't have to have um, these artificial uh, mechanisms. Now, um, one thing I'm missing out is the earned income tax credit, which was uh, started, I think, under, under President Reagan, was expanded uh, quite substantially. It's, it's far from perfect, um, and it, it does create some nasty incentives uh, on, on people um, who move, uh, who increase their income. They may find they face actually very high marginal tax rates because they lose the earned income tax credit, and they may lose other benefits as well as they, as they increase their wage. But still, I think something like the earned income tax credit, I prefer to uh, increasing the the minimum wage, it provides a subsidy for relatively low wage uh, workers. Um, 
But, uh, <clears throat> you know, we don't do, we are not doing a good job on, on K through 12 education, particularly for young men. And Obama talked about that young black man. It's not just young black men, it's, it's uh, uh, young men more generally we're not doing a very good job on. Um, I, I think there are some examples now, some states in the United States, including Massachusetts and Texas, some countries, uh, Finland, Germany, that have done good jobs at actually improving uh, their educational performance. And so I think we do now have some paths open to improving K through 12 education, um, but we're not, we're not doing a great job of it right now. Uh, and in fact, because of the cuts in state and local spending, we may, we may actually be going backwards in terms of education. On the training, we don't do much of it, and that that we do, we do, we do not very well. And there's been a lot of work here at the University of Chicago evaluating uh, training schemes, which comes to some pretty gloomy conclusions about what you get out of those schemes. Um, if you look at other countries, uh, Denmark spends a lot on training. Uh, they have a, the so-called flex security system. Uh, they have lot high labor force participation. Uh, staggering tax rates, but but uh, they spend a lot of money on training people at the training. bottom. So there may be some some lessons one could learn on doing it better. Um, there, there is a, a maybe an encouraging, just a sliver of hope. There are there are some folks now who are in the private equity business that are saying uh, we can do social policy better than some of the government bureaucracies. That's happening in Europe and the UK where there are private equity uh, investors who are saying, we will put money into programs to reduce recidivism among prisoners. Um, and, and we obviously have a huge prison population in the United States, and those people that come out of prison don't do very well in the labor market. Um, so, and and uh, Goldman Sachs is organizing a fund to try to improve the schools in Utah. Whether these are just little tiny things that won't ever grow, I don't know. But uh, I wish we could find a way to get sort of private sector incentives, uh, more effective incentives into training programs and, and improving skills uh, because we're not doing a good job right now. Um, I think it's very good that Martin focused on the bottom end because uh, when some people talk about inequality, it's all about how can we bring down the top and I think that's the wrong way to go. So I think poverty is a problem, inequality per se, is not a problem, but poverty, low incomes, low um, ability to move up uh, is a potential problem. And I think um, we, we're beginning to hear more talk about training systems rather than the presumption that everybody should go to college. And uh, because what we hear is that so many people go through college and come out and get jobs that, quote, don't need a college education. And so it's going to require a change in people's attitudes uh, so that they say, gee, if I could be a very well-paid electrician, that would be a lot better than having a not very good job and uh, where I wear a tie and can say um, I'm a college graduate. So I think more on the training thing, learning from what happens in Switzerland, learning from what happens in Germany, uh, that may be a direction that's worth going. One of the interesting studies about the, um, uh, the changing uh, Gini coefficient, the fact that there is more overall inequality, it recently appeared as an NBR working paper. You can see where I do my homework. Uh, that appeared as an NBR working paper uh, showed that a, a key driver has been what is known as assortative mating, meaning uh, high-income men marrying high-income women. And that has changed over the last 30 years as more women have gone to business school or professional schools uh, or made uh, uh, serious uh, careers and married guys like themselves. So uh, the result is that the increase in the Gini coefficient, I think from 1970 to about 2010, is fully explained by the assortative mating. That is, if people, uh, if the marriage patterns in 2010, the correlation between the incomes of husbands and wives was the same in 2010 as it had been in 2007, 
the Gini coefficient would not have, um, not have uh, changed at all during those 30 years. So we don't want to stop that. Uh, we don't want to stop people who go to the Booth School from marrying each other, but it has this uh, effect on the overall income distribution. My, my, some of my colleagues at, at Brookings are uh, looking at the bottom end of that, and, and they've written some very persuasive things or very powerful things saying that if um, young, uh, young people, particularly I think young women, um, will avoid having a child before they get married um, and will get married and stay married, then they, the chances of them being poor are um, very sharply reduced. Now, that's one of those things you have to be a bit careful which way the causality is going. Uh, they sort of assume it's going one way, but, but that's not necessarily true. And one of the problems that a, a lot of poor young uh, women have is, is that, you know, the guys uh, don't have jobs. The guys, you know, they, they say, why, why, am I, why would I marry those guys? Uh, and, and maybe that's another side of assorted mating, unfortunately, uh, which is assorted non-marriage and, and out of wedlock uh, childbirth. But I think that's another part of the, of the poverty story. I know it's a big topic to tackle in 10 minutes, but I feel like we got somewhere. So we have about 20 minutes left. If there's anyone who would like to ask a question, there are microphones on either side of these two aisles. Please use the mics so we can get your question on tape. So we got one coming. Normally we wait a while. Um, uh, how is inequality not being ex explained fully by assorted of mating consistent with the fact that I believe that a Real incomes for the bottom have declined recently, while income, real incomes have, at the top have risen. Am I, do I have my facts wrong? Uh, I, I must admit, I didn't think you could explain all of the increase in the Gini. Now, that, that paper may, my, my colleague um, Gary Burtless has looked at this, and he did find a significant effect. I didn't think it was quite as much as as uh, Marty was uh, suggesting, but it's certainly been some of it, what, why the upper income folks or the upper middle class has done, done well. Now, the folks at the top, it's much more because of the, the, the star system. You know, athletes make much more, CEOs make much more, senior managers, traders on Wall Street. The, 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 the runaway top is much more, I think, because of the structure of, of where jobs are, uh, are playing out. So that can happen, and at the same time, it's possible that the Gini, which brings together so many disparate pieces of the income distribution, uh, behaves as I described. But I think my facts are right, but nbr.org, just put in a sort of mating, and you'll get a link to the, uh, the working paper, and you'll be able to see it. It's a very nice, simple bit of statistical calculations, nothing very fancy. Hi, I wanted to ask you guys about, um, you kind of touched on this a second ago, but what do you think can be done about the student loan situation in the U.S. as it is? Sorry, student what can be done about student the student loan, loan student, student debt situation, situation really? Mm. Do you want to comment on that? Um, it's not something I have a lot of expertise on. No. Uh, it's a very serious problem. It's growing very fast. They've recently decided to increase the interest rate on the federal loans so that the problem, if anything, is going to get worse. Uh, I think the rate is going to go up to something like 6% now and be indexed to a federal borrowing rate. Um, I don't have an answer to that, other than <clears throat> that people have to be cautious about taking on these loans uh, if they're not going to be training for something that's going to give them the earning power uh, to service those loans. Well, that's one of the things I was going to add, and it's not a direct answer to your question. You guys, if you're at the business school, are all doing what, 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 what I would say, but uh, what but has they're changed... They're typically undergraduate. Uh, okay, you're not at the Booth School. I, I Physically they are, but... Um, <laughs> physically they are. They're physically here. Never mind, never mind the audience. What I was going to say is there <laughs> has been a substantial shift in choice of majors by people going to college. So one of the reasons some people are coming out of college and not being able to um, 
get a good job or make a decent income is because we're seeing fewer people going into uh, science, the uh, math kind of pub, uh, occupations, and more going into liberal arts occupations. And I'm nothing against liberal arts. It just doesn't necessarily generate uh, much of an income. <laughs> I guess that didn't come out quite the way I wanted to. Yeah. For some people, it turns out to be a very good thing. But for a lot of people, it doesn't. And that's the problem. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. <laughs> well, let, let me grab this topic for a second. So, Professor Feldstein, you were just telling us that we need to abandon this idea that everyone should go to college. Do you think these two things are related? About um, people taking on mountains of student debt? Yeah, sure, they are related. And I think, um, um, I think the, uh, the federal uh, subsidy program, separate from the student loans, uh, I think we ought to say those subsidies are for people who are taking uh, majors which are going to be productive in the sense that I'm going to shift oh, the you're, blame you're to You're tough. Yeah. <laughs> you may be tougher than me. You're going to force people into... No, I'm just not going to subsidize okay. people to go and study things that are going to turn out to be useless when they come out. <laughs> like poetry. And oh, man. Like poetry, <laughs> right. I hope there are no English majors in here. <laughs> anyway. Thank you so much. We've got a couple over here. You want to ask a question? No. Okay. Yeah, you're next. So, yeah, all right. Um, I'm just wondering about your perspectives on prevention from a healthcare standpoint, as well as early childhood intervention. So, for those parents that do have children when they're very young and unmarried, getting them resources for their child birth through three or birth through six before they come into the public education system behind. So uh, healthcare prevention and public education prevention, or like kind of uh, failure prevention, I guess. So no, no claim of expertise, but it strikes me that um, in all of the, the programs where one says, let's limit uh, costs by larger co-payments and so on, it makes sense to say, let's carve out some of the preventive things um, uh, and, and not have co-payments for that. Those are relatively cheap and yet maybe quite important and we don't want to discourage people from doing it. That's about as much as I know to say. One, one of the difficulties we've had with the American system of health insurance is that traditionally there's been a lot of mobility so people don't stay with the same health insurer. So, it's created a disincentive, really, for insurers to provide preventive uh, health care. Right. That's changed some, I think. Uh, uh, the, 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 these folks are not just, I mean, they are driven by money, but, but there is a realization that preventive stuff, and so you can certainly um, get uh, various kinds of mammograms and, and colonoscopies and stuff from uh, regular health insurance. But traditionally, that's, that's been a place where the incentives haven't been aligned because uh, something that, that's going to pay off 10 years down the road, that person is probably not going to be your uh, customer 10 years uh, down the road. And so that affects the incentives. I, I think there's been a lot of wonderful work here at Chicago about uh, how important it is to do early intervention in uh, young people. So when I think about things getting squeezed out of the budget because of what we're paying for Medicare and Social Security, I think one of the things uh, that I would like to see more government spending on is exactly on, um, you know, I don't know if Head Start works that well, but whatever does work, we need to try to uh, increase the availability of that. If, if uh, hopefully time permits, I've got one quick quickie for each for Professor Felstein. The today's session is called Views from the White House Economist. So most of us have some notion of what the Council of Economic Advisors does, but can you give us a little bit about the history and number one and, and secondly uh, how the Council of Economic Advisors relates to the other big Fed movers and shakers like the Treasury Secretary and the, and the Fed and for Mr. Slash Professor Bailey, you both of you talked about the e economy not growing well enough, and and you use the term, Mr. Bailey, weak economy, but yet for the we hear that the Dow Jones is now over sixteen thousand. So with can you, which seems like an apparent disconnect. So can you help me on that one after 
with Professor Feldstein finished. I think I got the easier question. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the uh, Council of Economic Advisors was created legislatively in um, 1946. And um, when I talk to people about the Council of Economic Advisors, I think they picture a, a large group sitting around <laughs> a big <Yes>. table. <laughs> there are three members of the Council of Economic Advisors, a chairman and two other members. And the job of the council, and a small staff, a staff of a couple of dozen uh, people, typically academics who come and spend a few years working uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors. But the thing that's unique about it in comparison to other countries is that the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors reports directly to the president. So I reported to Ronald Reagan, and uh, Martin reported to Bill Clinton, and not through a treasury secretary or not through a minister of economics, and that's very important. Because there are a lot of good economists uh, throughout the federal government, but even the top guy in the agriculture department or the top economist in the commerce department, he reports to the secretary of agriculture or the secretary of commerce, and whatever the policy line is, of that department, he's going to defend. He's going to help his secretary come up with good arguments and so on. The CEA is not in that business. The CEA is trying to figure out what is the right, what are the right policies, and um, now how do we interact with the other departments? Well, I think Martin should also answer because I can only tell you what happened <clears throat> in the Reagan administration. An issue gets proposed by, say, the Agriculture Department. At a staff level, it then gets discussed, and if the economists from Treasury and the CEA can persuade their friends in agriculture that that's another screwy idea that they should drop, then it gets moved up to a, a discussion in which the Chairman of the Council and the Secretary of the Treasury and others will discuss it with the Secretary of Agriculture. And if that doesn't settle the issue, then a memo would be produced for the President saying this is the position of the CEA, this is the position of the Agriculture Department, and so on. And occasionally the President would say, well, I want to hear you guys discuss this. And so it'll be put on an agenda at a meeting uh, in which the different departments uh, could have their say. But that's basically the way in which things interacted. On the budget, the Treasury, the Office of Management and Budget, and the CEA worked together with the President and the White House in producing the, the budget outlook and, and making recommendations about major parts of the budget. I think that's a very good description. What was uh, started in, in the Clinton administration and has continued is the development of the National Economic Council, which I think confuses a lot of people uh, in principle, what the, the NEC does is this coordination role. So it chairs the meetings in which we, if we discuss these issues, and then they go to the, the president. But one of the wonderful things, and it's a great job to have to be chairman of the council, is that you do get to interact with the, um, with the president. Um, Bill Clinton had his flaws. I think there's no question about that. But uh, one of the things that made it fun to work for him was that uh, he's got a very high IQ and a very quick understanding of economic issues so that he really did like to uh, engage and debate uh, with us on the economic issues. And he read every memo um, that we, we wrote and he would send many of them back with comments and questions uh, about them. And, and so that was an exciting part of that process. I've, I've been in one briefing with, with President Obama and uh, I, I think he's a very smart guy too, but he he didn't interact in quite the same way. He he we took it was a whole group of us, and we talked, and and he listened. So it's a little different atmosphere. I'm sure that's not necessarily true with with his senior staff, but in the group I was in, it was a little different atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a really good question. Why is the stock market doing so well? Okay, first let's be careful on the premise. Remember, if you adjust for inflation, the stock market today is not so much above where it was got to at its, its peak. So it is doing well, but it's, it's not 
at this point, it's certainly not out of line with with uh, price earnings ratios or the traditional uh, valuation that you would put on the earnings. But corporate earnings are doing very well. So if the economy um, is still weak, why are corporate earnings uh, doing well? Well, I think corporate earnings get hit in downturns. There's no question profits. Um, I'm trying to look at the person that asked the question. Are you in the back there? Um, if they, when the economy goes into recession, corporate earnings take it on the, on the chin, and certainly we saw a massive decline, which was obviously tied to the financial crisis as, as well. So it was sort of an overreaction to um, to what was what was happening, and when the Dow got down to what did it get down to six thousand, seven thousand. Um, so so in in, in that phase, uh, corporations and, and corporations reacted very strongly. That's one reason we got such a huge drop in employment. Uh, a lot of corporations just were were in a let's get cut every cost we can possibly cut and get rid of every employee that we don't absolutely need, uh, and that was part of the dynamic of this uh, this deep uh, recession. So, uh, you know, profits can do well in an economy that's still below its potential, below its capacity. You can still have unemployed workers, and and profits are still doing fairly well. The other thing I would comment on is, is that there are people who say, well, one of the reasons for the slow economy is because innovation has faded away. Robert Gordon, your neighbor in Northwestern, has made that, uh, made that argument. Tyler Cohen has uh, made that argument at times that, you know, the, the, the low-hanging fruit are gone and now in, uh, innovation is not, uh, not taking place the same way. Well, it's very hard to measure innovation. I've, I've spent time in my career trying to do that and it's, it's really hard to measure. Patents is not a great measure. You can, you can try to, people do a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence about, uh, about innovation. I've, it doesn't make sense to me to say that innovation is not taking place. I mean, it just seems that we're in a, a world where uh, everything is transforming very quickly, a lot of it tied to the electronics revolution, but not, not all of it. Uh, a lot of things are changing. Globalization tends to drive economic uh, change. Uh, people now are trading more, uh, investing in other countries more. Uh, so I think we are getting a lot of innovation, um, but the nature of that innovation may be different. We're not kind of, <clears throat> it used to be in the 50s and 60s, you know, uh, an American company would come up with a new product, a new service, and it would be manufactured here. And the, the, some of the share of that, that innovation would go to workers. And I don't think that happens in quite the same way. And I think that's part of what maybe we're calling skill, skill bias technical change. The designers, the salespeople, the CEOs, they uh, do well out of that situation. But the worker that doesn't have a lot of skills no longer necessarily benefits from a lot of that innovation. Okay. Let's take one more question over here. We've got about five minutes. I'm gonna... I have a broad question, but what are your guys' opinion on immigration policy reform? I think we have a crazy immigration policy. Um, we, we bring a lot of people to the United States as foreign students, and then we force them to go home. And, um, you know, there, there is some, uh, you know, one needs to worry a little bit about brain drain. We don't want to pull all the skilled people out of poor countries so they don't have enough. But, but I think in terms of, of U.S. interests, that's a crazy policy to have, and we should encourage people to stay. I was a foreign student, and uh, I stayed. Um, and, and quite a few managed to do it, but, but I think we should make that, that easier. And I think the limits on H-1B visas are very, very few of them. I mean, it's a very small number. Uh, is sort of crazy too. I don't think they displace American workers. In fact, I think maybe they help employment of American workers. Um, the reason that immigration policy has gotten bogged down is because um, the, the, the Hispanic community wants to link uh, H-1B visas and, and that kind of stuff to uh, immigration reform for lower skill workers. And that's sort of hung up the Congress in getting something passed. Nothing to add. All right. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us. Both of our panelists have agreed to stay around for a little while afterwards. So if any of you have individual questions that were not raised during our now two hours talking up here, uh, feel free to come and approach them. Uh, we're going to be serving pizza very soon, and that'll be, where is that, Amy? It's going to be right over there. Next door. Next door. Never mind. We're changing our minds. Um, 
But again, I want to thank the Becker Friedman Institute for helping us to sponsor this event, and I want to thank, thank both of our panelists for coming and sharing their insights. Thank you. Thank you.